Let's go. This is Mr. Lewandowski. We're going to be talking today about tense present democracy English and the wars over usage by David Foster Wallace. Um, it would be great if you read this essay. It would help you a lot, help you become a better reader, smarter person. And uh, I'm going to focus in my analysis on vocabulary, rhetorical strategies, argument. I'm going to read chunks of it aloud. And this is David Foster Wallace's writing. So I have to have this disclaimer at the outset. I will not be engaging in any David Foster Wallace DFW worship. And I will not be engaging in any attempts to cancel DFW. I am in neither of these camps because I'm interested in the work. And the writer, I'm not saying read David Foster Wallace because it's lessons for how to be a good human or he's provided an instruction manual for thinking about the world. But he created some works that are worth studying. And so the focus is going to be on the work. If you're interested in either of these things, utilize your computer resources and you can look them up. If you're interested, I, I do have opinions about some of that stuff, and I would share them with you in the comments if you're interested. We can do that. This is published in Harper's, Harper's Magazine, 2001, 20 years ago. Harper's is kind of important as a magazine. Um, it published writings of like Mark Twain, Kurt Vonnegut, E.B. White, Theodore Roosevelt, Marilyn Robinson, Sylvia Plath, Zadie Smith. These are like some great, great Great writers. Notice I didn't say great humans, because, I don't know, I'm interested in the works. Tense present. Here we go. The first thing that uh, David Foster Wallace and the editor of the magazine has done for you. So this is in perhaps one of the reasons that it's a strong uh, example of his writing, is he worked very closely with an editor to create something that would be uh, palatable to readers. Um, <laughs> David Foster Wallace could, uh, well, for example, he wrote an essay about going on a cruise. He wrote it for Harper's because Harper's recognized he was a tremendous talent as a writer. Uh, what he gave them to publish was like, I don't know, I have the, it's like, it's like a 112 page essay or something. Um, his editors at Harper's made it a lot smaller and maybe made it a lot better. Maybe. Might be a discussion for another time. Uh, so the beginning here, we have a bunch of phrases that you can read. And there's something wrong with all of them. So ostensibly, these are all drawn from print. Maybe if they're quotations. There's no attribution, but they're published somewhere. Um, these are problematic to David Foster Wallace. Subsequent to this time, for example, is too many words. Why don't you just say after? You gain nothing. So he was a tremendous critic of language, how language was used. And that's one of the, one of the fields that he plows in this work is his own relationship to language. He identifies as a snoot, which I'll talk about a little bit later, irregardless. So these are the kinds of words and phrases to mentor, to parent, to partner. Uh, the verbization, verbization of these words, I think he feels that they are strong as nouns, but they don't really, shouldn't operate as verbs. So it could be fun to read all of this and say, what is wrong? I thought to myself, what do you gain by saying I thought to myself instead of I thought? A long-standing tradition of achievement in the arena of excellence. Vomitous, that is a vomitous prose. So, how's his prose? The occasion for writing this essay is, this is something that is a, is a standard convention in Harper's is they will invite a guest writer to do book reviews, but their book reviews are never in isolation. So they invite a writer to create an essay that examines maybe several different books that are connected thematically. 
I'm not sure the exact story, but they approached David Foster Wallace for this task and the book that he chose is right here. It's a fatty, it's a fatty. It's a book about how to use language. It is Brian A. Gardner's Garner's Modern English Usage. That's the most recent edition, still in print, still being reprinted, still an excellent guide for what you should and should not do when you are writing. So, discussed in this essay, A Dictionary of Modern American Usage, Brian A. Garner, Oxford Press, 1998. I have the most recent edition, uh, 35 bucks. But he's gonna talk about these works as well. These are different dictionaries published at different times. And once you get into his argument, you'll find out that he's using those dictionaries to examine what it is to create a dictionary. So I'll read the first sentence here, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from there. Do you think my voice sounds like Kanye's? So here we do have a partial volta, because this is definitely a semantic turn right here. So in our structure, we have the inversion of the terminal rhyme. I don't know. I've never, I've never really listened to Kanye. I heard his new album's wonderful. Did you know that probing the seamy underbelly of US lexicography reveals ideological strife and controversy and intrigue and nastiness and fervor on a nearly hanging Chad scale. Well, there we are. Seamy is a, uh, a word that may or may not be part of your vocabulary. Seamy is a great word. Seamy would be referring to, I think of uh, like a place like New Orleans, a place like Las Vegas, or maybe like some, it's like the, the bad part of town. Like maybe the area where you could, uh, score some drugs, maybe uh, hire a sex worker. Seamy is kind of like dangerous. And uh, he's talking about dictionaries. Dictionaries, the seamy underbelly of US lexicography reveals ideological strife. So the seamy underbelly would be like, you might think that dictionaries are all, you know, just, uh, a bunch of nerds sitting around talking about words, but there's something that's kind of dangerous, controversial, kind of, well, ideological strife is like arguments between people about ideology and fervor on a nearly hanging Chad scale. Hanging Chad is a reference to a historical controversy uh, in the election between Al Gore and George W. Bush. So in inviting us into this essay, he's mixing really like two worlds that you wouldn't assume would mix. Something about like ideological strife arguments, fights, like this kind of like under underneath the surface of what seems like it's pretty boring there's something that's kind of exciting and dangerous. So I'm going to talk a little bit about David Foster Wallace and how he writes and what he, what he does. So David Foster Wallace frequently modulates and moves between extremes in register and tone. Register and tone are very similar. In fact, all of these words right here are fairly similar. Style, voice, tone, register, diction. Syntax is different, but they all are different words that you use to describe in detail different characteristics of someone's writing. So register normally has to do with formality. How formal is the language? So think about the Supreme Court legal academic register, formal, the most formal register. And then like a news story is a little bit less formal, but still you wouldn't, you know, when, if, you, if you ever watch the news, you'd never see a newscaster open the news with, 
What up, y'all? Uh, yeah, so today it was cray out there. No, that's slang. There's nothing wrong with slang, but you don't see that on the news because of the, the register and the expectation and the context for the communication. You know, the Supreme Court does not start out with what up. The Supreme Court starts with, may it please the court, Your Honor, I'm here to present the formal arguments in support of sophisticated language, complex syntax, and formal academic diction. Those are, those are the interrelated ideas. Everyday speech, then slang, then we got like text messages. So this is not to say that one of these is better than the other, it's just that these are different, well, really they're different Englishes different versions of English or different modes to communicate in English. I generally speak in a formal academic register, but like David Foster Wallace, from time to time, I, I move registers uh, to connect with my audience, it's my attempt to do. The occasion for this article is Oxford University Press's semi-recent release of Brian A. Garner's A Dictionary of Modern American Usage. The fact of the matter is that Garner's dictionary, so remember, it's a book review. This is his take on a book review, is extremely good. Certainly the most comprehensive usage guide since E.W. Gilman's Webster's Dictionary of English Usage, now a decade out of date. It's format. So his construction of his sentences is quite formal in, the, in this moment, in, this, in these introductory remarks. I think I'm going to move forward to the next page. And I think in order to do that, I'm going to have to read a footnote. So here we have some more information about register. Register, like I said, is normally a continuum of, in this case, formal over here and very informal over here. Now this word academic is sometimes applied. So we could say it's in an academic register. We could also say that it has an academic style, an academic voice. You know, these categories are not as clear cut as they would be. Like I frequently say to my students, this is literature studies, this is not calculus. So the boundary between register and style of voice a lot of times is not like black and white. It's more like shades of gray. So you could say about David Foster Wallace's writing that he frequently switches from a formal academic register to, I call it informal dude bro register almost. And let's see if we can get a, uh, uh, let's see if we can get a sense of that. The term I was raised with is snoot. The word might be slightly self-mocking, but those other terms are outright dysphemisms. So outright is not a formal academic word. Outright is kind of like a, yeah, man, it was an outright lie. A snoot can be defined as somebody who knows what dysphemism means and doesn't mind letting you know it. I submit that we snoots are just about the last remaining kind of truly elitist nerd. There are granted plenty of nerd species in today's America, and some of these are elitist within their own nerdy purview. So purview is a very sophisticated word, but the adjective that modifies it is nerdy, which is kind of a informal dude bro word. So he'll switch quite dynamically, even in, the sen even in one sentence. The syntax for these sentences is almost exclusively like complex very complex and carefully constructed. Let's take a little break here because there's a footnote. So if there's one thing that you want to talk about, if you're going to talk about David Foster Wallace, it would be his use of footnotes because his footnotes do really <laughs> surprising things. And this relates to over here when I talk about style and voice, kind of similar, kind of different. Style and voice is slightly different than register, but your style or voice could be described as muscular intellectual. That's how I describe it. You know, he's very um, forceful and very, oh, I guess forceful, Force, forcefully intellectual. 
Um, but at other times, he's also uncomfortably revealing. So he bounces back and forth between showing you almost like too much about himself, his history, his very, very personal things that might not pertain to the argument that he's making. What argument is he making? Well, at this point in the reading, all we know is that he's going to be examining the quality of Garner's book, which is a book that people would never really think about. And he's aware of that. And if you read this, you'll, under, you'll see where he kind of says, most people don't care about this stuff, but he does. So how does he get there? So he's going to use a little dude bro informal, uncomfortably revealing little anecdote about himself to introduce this word that is snoot. Okay. So the term I was raised with is snoot. Footnote three. So then you read down to the footnote and in the footnote, it's defined much like a dictionary would as a noun and as highly colloquial. He did a uh, abbreviation there of colloquial. Colloquial meaning a word that's used by a small in-group of people. A colloquial colloquialism is a, is a word that's used by a specific group of people. He calls this highly colloquial because the specific group of people who use this word is his own family. And so I'll read this and we'll see what sense we can get from that. So he says, I am a snoot. When it comes to language, I am a snoot. Highly colloquial. Is this reviewer's nuclear family's nickname, Aklef, for a really extreme usage fanatic? His use of words like really? The sort of person whose idea of Sunday fun is to look for mistakes in Sapphire's columns prose itself. That's a reference to William Sapphire's column that was in, I think, maybe the Wall Street Journal where he like talked about how to use language correctly. This reviewer's family is roughly 70% snoot, which term itself derives from an acronym with the big historical family joke being whether or not snoot stood for sprachfühl necessitates our ongoing tendence or syntax nudniks of our time, which is just like dorky, but it's beyond dorky. It's embarrassing. Um, and then like there's more revealed. So these footnotes, there's a shift in tone in the footnotes. So when you're looking and thinking about tone, you want to think about shift in the footnotes, which is pretty interesting. A few more things I want to mention. I thought this would be short, but it's not. Um, his use of asterisks here and the fact that the editor is revealing things about the process through which the editor went through in moving this forward. So here's a footnote. He says, since this will most surely get cut, I'll admit that yes, as a kid, was the actual author of this song. Embarrassing, revealing, not anything that you would regular consider part of an academic argument. This is metatextuality. So this is the text in the text itself is examining the production and, uh, well, the production of the text. How was it made? So we can see here little fights with his editor and his, since this will almost surely get cut, well, it wasn't, but that lets us know that he has this self-consciousness. That's another huge uh, aspect of his writing, especially his, this is, the argument that he's making is extremely academic. It's ex extremely like, um, well, but he gets very personal in making that argument. And what is the argument? So he, he does this goofy thing with snoot. He's a snoot. But then he does this, which moves the argument forward. But the snoot's purview, what the snoot sees, what the snoot understands, what the snoot cares about or has expertise in is interhuman social life itself. You don't, after all, despite withering cultural pressure, have to use a computer, but you can't escape language. Language is everything and everywhere. It's what lets us have anything to do with one another. It's what lets us. That's how powerful language is. There is no anything with each other without language. It's what separates us from the animals 
And he goes to the Bible for receipts on that. And so very quickly, he's moved from like goofy dude, bro, embarrassing family story to like, this is the most important argument that you can make. There is nothing more important than language. Pretty, pretty effective. I think that's pretty effective. And then he helpfully lets us know thesis statement for the whole article. Issues of tradition versus egalitarianism in U.S. English are at root political issues. Can be effectively addressed only in what this article hereby terms as the democratic spirit. He's going to define the democratic spirit for us. He invented it for the, well, he didn't invent de democracy or spirits, but he put them together. He's going to define that in several paragraphs. What does it mean? But here is tradition versus egalitarianism, the fight that's happening in language. What is that seamy underbelly that he talks about? What is the, what is that controversial aspect? Well, it has to do with things like this. Here's some young Dolph lyrics. I don't care about your opinion, wear the check, which has meaning. It's a great song. I don't care about where you, I don't care about your opinion, wear the check. But traditionally, if you were an English traditionalist, you would have a problem with this because there's no verb here and it doesn't have a question mark because he doesn't say, where's the check? Which he's saying in English. He says, where the check? So it means something different, but it violates some rules of grammar that might exist or might not exist, or maybe they don't matter. Now, egalitarianism would say, this language is as good as any other language because it means something and the person who hears it understands it. And so who are you to have a problem with young Dolph? He makes more money writing than you do. So why would you think that his English is not as good as anybody else's English? Well, this is the controversy that he's getting at. This is the whole <laughs> point of David Foster Wallace's writing is to examine that, to dig right into that. And here we have assessing Garner's book then involves trying to trace out the very weird and complicated relationship between authority. So authority says that's a grammar error, young Dolph. Please fix your grammar if you're going to think about having your ideas considered by others. And democracy, which says, A, any language, if it does its job as language, that's good language. That's everybody's language is good language. No, only the correctly articulated, sophisticated, grammatically correct with commas and nouns and verbs all doing the things that experts say they're supposed to do. Authority says that. Democracy says this. So the purpose of this essay for David Foster Wallace is to help his readers go on a journey of understanding. Assessing Garner's book then involves trying to trace out the very weird and complicated relationship between authority and democracy and what we as a culture have decided is English. Should I do part two? Do we need more? Let me know.